Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm going to be going over the white lung situation that's going on with this pneumonia and how this is caused by AIDS-like syndrome. Now, this is uh, this is going to be a multi-part series. Um, I'm recording this on December 5th, 2023. Now, I did a video yesterday on the baseline of what's going on in the world. Please go and see that. It's China, white lung, uh, and why it's happening. All right? And that was part one. This will be part two. There might be a four-part series or it might be a three-part series, depending on how much I can jam into this session here. So this is going to be a little complicated here. So I, I've, I've broken it up into different pieces. I'm going to I'm going to start with the lymph node, all right, and build you up on why this is AIDS-like syndrome, all right. But for you to understand what AIDS-like syndrome is, I have to give you a background in immunology and lymph nodes. So what I have on the screen here is a lymph node. And uh, let's uh, just kind of walk through here. Uh, let's start with the, the uh, afferent migration into the lymph node. So right here we have is a, a lymph node right in the middle of the, the screen. Okay, and I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. I, hopefully you can. So in the, it, with the afferent, the, the afferent, um, a lymph node, uh, a lymph is going into the lymph node, all right? And there are different things. There are different types of cells. There's antigens, there's APCs, there's T cells. There's, there's a bunch of cells, there are a bunch of cell types that are flowing into the, into the lymph node. And then it'll go into different sections. I'll have another slide that shows a little bit more of the detail of the, of the actual anatomy of the, the lymph node. You have, so you have this migration, the lymphocyte migration coming in to the, the lymph vessel, all right? This is, this is the afferent, afferent meaning going into, efferent you know, leave, leaving, okay? So you have the, e, the afferent coming in and then the, con, the uh, convex section of the lymph node is the efferent that's leading out, okay? Now, you have the cortex, and that cortex, um, there's some complexity. There's light and dark uh, cortex, but we're not showing that. And then there's the paracortex, which is, you know, next to or to the, uh, or around the, the, the cortex. So this cortex primarily has B cell activation, all right? Now we're talking in generic terms here. There's some nuances if you really want to get it at the PhD level, but let's just stick with the, the, the basics here. So there's B cell activation that's going on in the, in the cortex, okay? And there are, the, there are what is called follicles, primary and secondary follicles in, in germa, uh, uh, germinal um, um, nodes. All right. Now, in the para in the paracortex, it's primarily the T cell activation. All right. So you have B cell activation in the cortex of the lymph node, and you have T cell activation in, in the paracortex. Now you have the the medulla of the lymph node. Right. And this is where you have lymphatic accumulation that's taking place to be able to start leaving the, the lymph node. And in the paracortex, not only do you have T cell activation, but you need T cell suppression. And this is going to be important because when we start going into the details of the AIDS like syndrome, there is this interplay that's that's happening between um, T cell suppression and T cell activation. Okay, 
now. Hopefully I can advance here. Yeah, okay. Now here is a diagram showing a little bit um, of the interplay between bones, the thymus, and the lymph node. Remember what I talked, I, I was mentioning in the previous video about the, the thymus, how it's very active for children, and as we get older, it becomes less active, okay? Now, again, this is in generic terms. There's a lot of nuances to this, but in, we'll start with the, the bone. So in the bone, you have, you have um, marrow, right? And some of that is yellow marrow and you have uh, red marrow, right? So you have the stem cells in the, in the red marrow give rise to the lymphocyte precursors, all right? Now, if these precursors are disrupted, then downstream effectiveness of your B cells and some of your T cells will be affected. So in the hemo, there are, there are, there are things called like hem hemopoietic stem cells. If those are disrupted, and it has been shown that they are, <laughs> that anything downstream will be less effective or may actually be uh, 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 hyperactive, all right? And this is the reason why I said, keep in mind that there are two things in terms of the immune system that can, can happen in this post-COVID post era an overreactive immune system or an underreactive immune system. And the underreactive immune system is what I call the AIDS-like syndrome. And the overreactive immune system is what you start to see with autoimmune disease and immune thrombocytopenia and, um, you know, and other diseases that are associated with just an overreaction of the immune system. Now, this precursor that's coming out, this lymph lymphocyte precursor that's coming out, there are two types, all right? One's going to be going uh, and eventually turn into a T cell, and the other is going to be, you know, some are going to be, there's actually a lot of different precursors that are coming from the hemopoietic stem cell, but we're just focused on the T cell, the, the lymphocyte precursors that end up being a T cell or a B cell. Okay. So one of these precursors ends up going into the thymus. The other precursor is going to end up going into the lymph, lymph node. All right. So let's start with the one that's going into the thymus. So in the thymus, you will have this precursor that will um, eventually start to mature and the, it will it will actually turn into through a complex cascade of electric you know of uh, chemical signaling uh, turn into a type of T cell okay now there are different types of T cells but we'll get to that shortly then <laughs> The other precursor, the B cell, some of these, some of these lymphocyte precursors from the bone marrow will end up being B cells and they'll they'll go to the lymph node. Now, the B cells and the T cells go to the lymph node and they domicile in different locations. All right, remember what the previous slide showed. The T cells domicile in the paracortex. And then there's actually a boundary called the um, the uh, the BT zone. So this is a T zone. The paracortex is a T zone. The B zone is the cortex for the B cells. And then they're, they kind of overlap in a, a BT zone, okay? 
And that's important. But just to remember, they domicile in the lymph node in different areas, T cell in the paracortex and B cells in the cortex. All right. So both T cells and B cells are transported through the blood to the lymphatic organs, such as the lymph nodes and the spleen. Okay. So there's, there's this kind of flow. All right. It's going to the thymus through blood transport. Right. And then you have the lymphatic tissue that's actually coming in from the, the afferent, uh, the, the lymphatic, um, um, the lymph, the, the, the fluid, uh, the lymph that's going into the lymphatic tissue, which is, you know, some of that stuff, some of that stuff is actually the actual lymph node. All right. So, so keep that in mind. All right. Blood transport of the precursors to the thymus and to the, to the lymph node. And then they, the lymph node, it, it domiciles. All right. Now there is some immune stuff that's going on with the spleen, but we're just going to stick with this in this presentation. I just want to kind of really focus on the lymph node. Okay. Now what's going on? How does this all flow? What's the flow of this? All right. So we want to start, remember what I said, lymph comes from the uh, lymph is coming uh, from the lymphatic circulation into the lymph node all right there's kind of this fluid that that is in the extracellular matrix that that starts to filter into the lymphatic system so we have a venous system right we have a atrial system and we have this lymphatic system that that kind of follows each other. Okay. Now <clears throat> you have afferent and efferent. Afferent goes into the lymph node, and efferent goes out of the lymph node. So here we have afferent lymphatics. Okay, it's going into this into the the lymph node and it's carrying the lymph so this is the fluid from the peripheral tissue the afferent lymphatics penetrate the capsule of the lymph node on the side opposite the hilum now the hilum is where you have the afferent the i'm sorry the efferent port you know where everything's leaving out now, what is interesting is you can also see with these, these um, ducts, <clears throat> you can see in these ducts uh, valves. So it prevents backflow. If you look at the these ducts, these it prevents backflow. And we actually have valves in our in some areas of our venous system. <clears throat> All right. Next is the efferent, the afferent, uh, the afferent uh, vessels deliver lymph to the subcapsular space. A meshwork of reticular fibers, mac macrophages, and dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are involved in the initiation of the immune system. We've talked about these APCs, right? So the lymph, no, the, the lymph is going to flow from the afferent duct, right? And start flowing into the, the, um, this just surrounding the cortex, right? Remember I was talking about the, the germinal center, uh, with the B cells. Okay. So it's going to start flowing around. And it's it it'll flow into the germinal cell, but it, it you a lot of it's flowing around it. Okay, the lymph next flows into the outer cortex, which contain B cells within the germinal centers to re, to resemble the the to resemble those of lymph 
lymphoid nodes. Okay, so now you're starting to get the potentiality of that lymph reacting to the B cells. <clears throat> now the lymph then flows through the lymph sinus. Okay. Into this deep, deep cortex, which is dominated by the T cells. See the, the B cells are in that in that germinal cell area in the, the germinal center, the follicle, and then you're going into the paracortex. Okay, now um, lymph contain uh, continues into the med medullary med medullary medullary sinus at the core of the lymph node. This region contains B cells and plasma cells, okay? So you have this, this region that's outside of the germinal cell and adjacent to the paracortex that's going to have B cells and plasma cells, all right? And then it eventually flows out into the efferent lymphatics. Okay. And so so the efferent lymphatics leave the leave the lymph node at the helium. And these vessels collect lymph, okay, from the, the medullary sinus and carry it toward the venous circulation. Okay, so this there's this flow that's taking place. And so you can kind of view the there's a lot of similarities between the lymph node and actually the spleen, but the spleen is filtering blood, really. Um, this is filtering, filtering lymph. But you can kind of see that, that these nodes that, that are chained along our venous system are, are uh, kind of like little filters, right? Little filters. And they have B cells and T cells in there. There's a lot going on with it. Okay, so let's let's go into a little bit more. Let's kind of again we have the afferent lymphatic coming in, and you can see the little valve that, that that's happening up in the upper part of this diagram, right? And then this subcapsulary sinus that it flows around, and then the cortical sinus, and then into the medulla. Uh, the medulla or the medullary area, and then the helium, and then out into the efferent lymphatic system. And then obviously you have the bl blood um, coming in through the artery and exiting out through the venous system. You have in the, you have uh, basically a paracortex that's in the center of the node, and you have a cortex that is just below the subcapsulary sinus, all right? And within the cortex, you have um, what is called a primary follicle, all right? Now, the secondary follicle will have a mantle zone, which is the outer shell of the secondary follicle and a germinal center. And in the cortex, you're going to have B cells. In the paracortex, you're gonna have T cells and dendritic cells, right? But also in the cortex, you will have follicular dendritic cells. Remember the dendrites uh, have an antigen that it's gonna present and subcapsular macrophages. So you're gonna have macrophages and, and you know, follicular dendritic cells in the cortex with the B cells. And in the paracortex, you're gonna have the T cells and the dendritic cells. In the medulla or the medullary area of the cortex or of the uh, um, the center of the, the lymph node will be the macrophages and the plasma cells that we talked about in the previous slide. So this gives you a little bit more of a diagram understanding that the afferent flow of the lymph coming through the subcapsulary sinus down into the, the, the cortical sinus into the 
medulla or the medullary sinus into the helium and then out through the efferent lymph uh, vessel. Now, there's a lot of activation that's taking place between the cortex and the paracortex. All right, now we need to go into a little bit of detail on that. Okay, so this is a schematic of a lymph node. Now you have a T zone. Remember, that's the para, that's the uh, paracortex, right? And you have the B zone, right? Um, and that is the germinal center. Okay, there is this kind of overlap. Remember, there's an overlap between the cortex and the paracortex, right? That 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 helps with communication. That's what we're we're representing here. Is this this kind of like the TB zone, right? Now, DC is the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell um, will present an antigen, right? And it's communicating with naive T cells, all right? And it's using the CCR7 um, receptor, all right? Now you have uh, what is called follicular hom uh, homing, okay? So once you have this naive T cell in the T zone, so in the paracortex zone, that's close to the the cortex zone, it will hone, okay, through chemotaxing. And this is your T, um, your T cell, it's the FH, or FH cells. So the, I'll go into detail a little bit more about this. So now you have a cell that is, is primarily using the CXCR5. Now you remember, CCR7 and CXCR5s uh, th these are important, especially in HIV. And uh, I've been saying that there is some sort of play with the CCR7 and the CXCR5 and 4 of, of, um, of T cells for SARS-CoV-2. Now, um, and that will be uh, an element of this AIDS-like syndrome that I'm talking about. So if you can if you can affect the CCR7 and you or the the CXCR5 and or the CXCR5 then you are inhibiting the 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 reaction that this is starting to to, to try to do. So part of AIDS like syndrome part of AIDS like syndrome is is um inhibiting this process. It's not the only way that AIDS-like syndrome can happen, but it's one of the ways, okay? It's through the CCR7 and the CXCR5. All right, then there's this, if, not, if nothing's inhibiting, you gotta remember this schematic is normal process, but if you're inhibiting one of these normal processes, then you're not gonna be able to create effective memory and, and um, uh, effector B cells. Okay, so this this diagram is showing normal process, but just keep in mind if you inhibit some something in this normal process, you're going to have the AIDS-like syndrome. So, going back to the T zone, you have this dendritic cell that is activating a, uh, a naive T cell, and it will um, activate the CCR7, and then eventually that turns that naive T cell into a, an uh, FH cell. Now the primary player is the CXCR5 pathway, it chemotaxes, and now it's, it's um, communicating with the B cell. It's communicating with a B cell And by doing so, they'll go through a whole chemical process through the CXCL13, and eventually it'll say in the in the germinal cell, um, in the germinal center of the lymph node in this cortex, right? 
there's going to be a, an, a production, an activation and production of B cells. And that will create uh, B, what is called B effector cells and B memory cells. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on that uh, in, in uh, some following slides. But keep in mind that <clears throat> there is this process in the T cell and the B cell. Um, and there is actually a little bit of bi-directional communication between B and T um, that I might go over here. But just keep in mind, T, T, cell, T zone, you have a dendritic. Remember we said we had dendritic cells in that para, paracortex. See, in the paracortex, we have the dendritic cells. So in these dendritic cells, there's, there's an antigen that's being presented to the T cell, and there's a there's this activation that's taking place, and then it's saying, "Oh, I am sensing something. I need to tell the B cells to get ready to create antibodies." But in AIDS-like syndrome, if you can inhibit the CCR seven pathway or the CXCR five pathway, then you are you're slowing down. Um, the production of the B effector cells and the B memory cells. All right, now we want to go into a little bit of detail on on uh, thorough schematic and what these these T helper cells. There's different types of T helper cells. Okay, so first there is this anti antigen recogn recognition through the APC, the antigen presenting cell. Then there's the clonal selection, and then there is the interleukin secretion. Okay, so let's start with the antigen recognition. All right, so your APC will have an MHC2 receptor. So what happens is the APC brings in the antigen, some sort of protein from bacteria or a virus or whatever, it doesn't matter. All right, and then, um, or, you know, a protein that's created or presented through an inoculation. And it presents itself on the MHC2. Now, there are two types of MHCs. So the MHC1 is for the CD8, and MHC2 is for CD4. So if it's being presented on MHC2, it's going to activate a CD4 positive T cell. If it's if it's um if it's uh on an MHC1, then it's going to be activating a CD8 positive cell. And then keep that in mind that if you have a down regulation of let's say CD8 positives, then that pull pathway of the MHC1 is inhibited. If you have something inhibiting the CD the CD4 positive or the MHC2, like a sub super antigen, then you are inhibiting this reaction. And this is why sub super antigen. Um, pathways uh, can lead to AIDS-like syndrome. Okay, so in this case, you have APC bringing in, presenting on the MHC2, and the CD4 positive attaching. There's a lot of things going on here, right? This is just generic representation. There's a lot of chemicals being released by the APC and the CD4 positive, and there's there's other connections that are taking place, but this is just a generic. All right, so you have your CD4 helper cell, and now it's going to go through cl clonal selection, okay? And it has two main ways to go. All right, is it going to go into a memory? So you have T memory cells and B memory cells, but in this case, because it's a T helper cell, it's, you know, will it go into T memory, or is it going to be an effector? All right, so if it's an effector, if it goes into the effector, then now you have different chemicals that are being released. All right, these are the cytokines. These are the different cytokines. These are inter interleukins that are being secreted. And depending on which types that are being secreted depends on what happens in these effector cells. All right, one type of, of interleukin secretion will lead to nonspecific defense. Those are macrophages and neutrophils, okay? Another type of interleukin will produce your killer T cells. So you're going to get the cellular immunity, 
Okay, it's going to go and attack that cell that happens to have that type of antigen. All right. And it can go and help with humoral immunity, which is through the B cell pathway to produce the, the antibodies. Okay, now this is gonna this is where it gets into a little bit more detail of the of the the T cell. So you have this dendritic cell that has this antigen presenting capability, and it's attached to this naive CD4 T cell. Now, once once it once it goes through this this uh, 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 attachment and gets kind of activated, right? It can turn that CD that CD4 positive cell now can turn into uh, or produce. Um, uh, T helper cell one, T helper cell two, T helper cell seventeen, T reg, and some others. There's there's some other there's quite a few, quite a few. But you know, there's not your main ones are one, two, seventeen, and T reg. But there's also you know twenty two and and others. Um, and I think that over time you know we'll understand more and more about what exactly these are doing but these are the the main ones all right now <clears throat> what turns these into a t a a t helper cell all right it's actually what is being secreted all right is it a is it the interleukin 12 and stat 4 right uh is it interleukin 4 is it interleukin you know, if it is it inter is it uh, TGF beta, interleukin six, interleukin twenty three, is it TGF beta and and Fox P three, right? So depending on what chemicals are being released, depends on what T helper cell you start to to get. All right, so so the numbers above the the cell here, the num, the 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 description that is above the cell is actually the chemical that determines what this turns into. Now, the cytokines that are being released from these cells are at the bottom. Okay, so the T, so you're native cd4 positive t cell when it's attached to a dendritic pres a, a dendrite that's presenting an antigen all right and it's activating this naive cd4 it will start to secrete there's chemicals that are communicating between the den dendrite and the 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 um the naive um cd4 right and if that chemical let's say happens to be interleukin 12 then you're going to create this t helper cell 1 if that t helper cell 1 is 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 created right then you have this interferon gamma and and t and f alpha that that is going to be produced by that t helper cell now, why is that important? The T helper cell one is going to help with fighting viruses, intracellular bacteria, okay? Intra, meaning out in, inside the cell. So this is going to be important for um, cells that have been in, infected by viruses and bacteria, okay? Uh, now, if you have a low count on your T, T helper cell one, then you're going to have problems fighting bacterial infections and vi viruses. All right. Now that inhibit that inhibiting factor could be all the way up at the naive CD4 T cell interaction with the dendrite through some sort of inhibitor, or it could be inhibiting the IL-12 chemical locally or it um 
you know, it has disrupted at the, remember when I said that these precursors, these precursor cells that are coming out of the bone, bone marrow, if they've been disrupted in such a way that uh, it prevents the T, the T helper cell one from being activated. All right. All these in, inhibiting or disruptions that I'm talking about would lead to AIDS-like syndrome. Okay, now for the T helper cell two. If interleukin four is released after this, after this, um, this uh, interaction with the dendritic cell and the T helper cell, then you are going to get the IL-4, you, you know, you might get IL-4, and some other chemicals, and that will create the TH2, the T helper cell 2. That T helper cell 2 will produce IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. Why is that important? Well, this is the humoral immunity for extra extracellular pathogens. So if this is down, if this is down regulated, you're not going to be able to fight pathogens that are extracellular outside of the cell. All right. So if you have a disruption in your immune system where it prevents the TH2s from being created, you're not going to be able to fight extracellular pathogens. All right. And, you know, a lot of these are the parasite type stuff. All right. Um, now, if you have, let's say, interleukin 6, interleukin 23, TGF beta, being produced, then you're going to get your, your T helper 17 cells. They produce IL-17A, IL-17F, and IL-22. Uh, IL um, IL, uh, okay, why is this important? Well, this is to help with the inflammation. And it's to fight extracellular pathogens and fungi. Um, and it's tied to autoimmune diseases. Now, if this can, if you have um, down regulation of the T help, the T helper seventeen cells, you're going to have problems with extracellular pathogens again, similar to the issue that you would have with the Th twos. So. Again, if you're inhibiting this, you're going to have a, a lower immune system. And this is this AIDS-like syndrome that I'm talking about. Now, T, TGF beta, if it was produced with the FOXP3, you will get Treg. Now, Treg is acts the opposite. Treg gets rid of and kind of um, prevents an overreaction of the immune system. So this is called immune regulation and peripheral tolerance, okay? So the Treg cells produce the TGF beta and the IL-10. IL-10 is considered an anti-inflammatory -inf cytokine, all right? Um, so you have pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Now, what is interesting with, T with uh, TH2 is, is that IL-4 is also considered pro-inflammatory at times and anti-inflammatory at times. So there is an interplay that, that, that takes place with the Treg and the TH2s. But it, just for simplicity here, um, Treg is to basically bring the immune system down so it doesn't over, it's not over active. Now, ones that have autoimmune diseases, their Treg can be not working correctly and it can't suppress the the th1s the th2s the the th17s all right if it's overproduced if treg is overproduced then it suppresses the immune system too much and hence you get aids like syndrome so if you have an in, if you have a disruption in the dendritic let's say you have the dis, you have interaction between the dendritic cell and the naive CD4s, right? T cell. And you produce a lot of TGF beta and you're producing a lot of FOXP3, 
right? For some reason, let's say those precursor T cells were disrupted through the V or through CV and, you know, through an inoculation or through a natural infection through the crisis we just went through. And you have an overproduction of TGF beta with Fox P3 and you produce too much of the Treg and not enough of the other cells like the Th1s, the Th2s, the T17s, then what will happen is, is that you'll actually have a low effective CD4 positive count because you have an overreactive Treg count. That's AIDS like that's another example of AIDS like syndrome. All right. So now um, when you have Treg, then it, that will produce the TGF beta and the IL-10. And there is an interplay to get rid of and and slow down the production of the T1s, the T2s, and the, the TH17s. All right. And then there are these other versions of T helper cells that we're not going to go into detail on. Now, in the next diagram, um, this is showing the interplay. Okay, it's a little it's a little complicated here, but let's let's try to walk through it. All right, you have your naive CD4 positive T cell. Now, if it's producing IL-12, then you're going to go into the you're going to create a T you're going to create a T helper cell one. And that T helper cell one now is going to have um, an inhibitory effect on TH17. And the T helper cell one will have an inhibitory effect on TH2. Now, what also can happen is that that naive CD4 positive cell can create IL-23, which creates, like I said, TH17, right? Well, TH17 can be inhibited through interferon gamma that's produced by TH1, or it can be inhibited by the TH2. So you can see here that there is some sort of self-regulation of TH17 through TH2 and TH1, right? And Treg, right? And that there is an there is a there is a suppression of TH2 by TH1, and there's a suppression of TH1 by TH2. All right. So there's kind of this, you can kind of see that there's this interplay. And then Treg can inhibit directly Th1 and Th2. All right. Now, the thymocyte can, the thymocyte is like what the, the very early days, the very early, um, um, the, the very early part of the cell. So the thymocyte can turn into a, a a naive CD4 cell or directly right into a Treg cell, okay? And that's through this, uh, the thymocyte can turn into a Treg cell by this, T, uh, this TGF beta and the FOXP3, all right? So that diagram is showing the interplay of production of cells and the inhibiting of the cells. Well, if you have overproduction and under-regulation, under inhibiting, then you have an autoimmune issue. Okay, you have, a, you have your your immune system is overreactive. You have a, all right now if you have an over inhibiting part of this diagram and an underproduction or normal production, and you have an over inhibiting component to this diagram, then you're going to have the AIDS like syndrome that is that that is that's taking place. For example, if you're over, if you have a system that's over inhibiting TH1 because of TH2 production, then you will have problems with fighting intracellular bacterial viruses, intracellular bacteria and, and, and viruses. All right. 
so that you can have a high T, TH2 count and a low TH1 count and show and it show AIDS like syndrome. All right. So not all CD4 positives, you, your count, the point I'm making is, is it's what are the effective CD4 count for particular helper cells? All right. Your overall count may be actually normal, but this interplay between the, in, the inhibiting factor um, may change your ability to fight extracellular or intracellular path pathogens so it's easy from just seeing this diagram and how aids like syndrome can can pop up all right now if you have something that's inhibiting some of these receptors like il12r then you're you may have a the correct th1 count but it's not really working very well also th17 if you have an il23 receptor that's inhibited or not working correctly. It's mutated in such a way it's not working correctly. It's not going to. It's not going to be able to fight extracellular pathogens. Same thing. IL four R. If that's inhibited or just mutated in such a way it's not working correctly, it's it's you're going to have the proper count, the Th two count, but your effective Th two would would be low, and therefore your extracellular um, pathogen fighting would be lower. So this diagram is really important to understand the, the complexity of what AIDS-like syndrome, how, how AIDS-like syndrome can emerge through either overproduction, over-inhibiting, or receptor mutation or, or uh, blockage. Now, in the next diagram, this is showing how IL-17 interplays with an antigen-presenting cell. Okay, so on the left, you have this antigen-presenting cell, and it's producing a cytokine, which is IL-23. Remember, IL-23 helps to create a TH17 cell, okay? And that, that, I, that APC right, is producing a certain cytokine, right, and that receptor, let's say, is active and be able to capture that, that cytokine, and now it, it activates this cell, and it helps with producing the TH17, and then the TH17 now can, can uh, release interleukin-17, Okay, so that this is how the dendritic cell is so important with this interplay with the naive CD4 T cell to create the cells that um, to, to, to help create these uh, these TH17s. All right, I mean, you can apply the same concept on how the TH1s and the TH2s. The dendritic cell can secrete the IL4 to help create the TH2. The same kind of mechanism. All right. Now on the right side here is a uh, antigen presenting cell, and it is using the CD1 pathway. Um, there's a glycolipid antigen, and it's attached to a a um, a T cell receptor that's kind of generic. All right, and this is another way where it can produce uh, IL-17, okay? So let's, so we spent a lot of time on this slide to, to, to understand the complexity of naive CD4s turning into TH1s, TH2s, T17s, and Tregs, and how the this interplay between them can be inhibitory. Now, Here's another diagram where you have the naive T cell, again, through the receptor CCR7, and CCR7 is tied to HIV, CXCR5 tied to HIV, all right? Now, if they're not working right, um, these cells aren't going to be able to do these T cell subsets, all right? 
Um, now, if a pathogen can get into the, C, you know, and activate, um, you use that receptor and, and, and uh, get into the cell, this naive T cell or activated T cell, either through the CCR, CC, R7 or CXCR5, then it could disrupt the cell. All right. Which I think it is happening with the with SARS CoV 2. Now, T cell subsets, again, like I said, we have the T helper cell 1, 2, 17, T reg, and the, the FH that we were talking about earlier. Okay. And inside uh then uh we have um for the th1 we have the cxcr3 that's an important receptor on the 17 we have a ccr6 receptor that's important and on the tfh we have uh cxcr5 all right now there's a site there are cytokines that are produced right now you got to remember, you know, what created the T TH1? Well, it's, you know, the IL-12 and the IL-27. What creates the TH2? Well, it's from the activator T cell. Um, and it's the IL, this interplay with that dendrite, right? Remember, there, you know, there's these dendrite act activations and stuff. So you have the IL, the, the IL-4 that helps produce the TH2 and the IL-25. IL-6 will help produce um th17 tgf beta helps produce the t-reg il6 il21 will help to produce the tfh okay and then once those are produced then it'll produce a certain type of cytokine like i said before on the previous slide you know for example um your your activated t cell i'm, I'm sorry your naive t cell uh, is activated through this this uh, interplay with the dendrite, right? And then there is a secretion. Let's say IL four and IL twenty five. Then you're gonna get, you, you'll get Th two cells, T T cells, and then that will start to produce IL four, IL five, and IL thirteen cytokines. Well, what is that? What's that for? Well, it's to, to help to kill parasites. So this slide is a, a another representation of the previous slide, but it's showing a little bit more of this interplay between the active T cell through the CXCR5. Okay. So that I think is, yeah, that's all I had for the, the, um, the, the explanation of, of the lymph node Right, and how that all is playing, and this this interplay with the CD4s. We just covered CD4s. There's also CD8s, right, and you know natural killer cells. But you can see that in the next video, I'll start to go into um, a little bit more detail on the AIDS like syndrome. But you get your your feet is wet now to understand the all these complex things that can happen with AIDS-like syndrome and how by not having, let's say, um, um, the right number of workable or active TH1s, how bacterial infections and viral infections can start to sprout up. And if you have an overproduction of, of Treg, how it could bring down your immune system. So what we're seeing with the white lung, pneumonia, and these other, and the key is, is that it's happening also in the same, on the same landscape as RSV and influenza, all right? These are showing that your immune system for these cohorts, like the elderly and especially the pediatrics, where the immune system isn't as robust as it should be and these opportunistic infections are starting to take hold. Now there's another 
there's another subset that needs to be that we need to take a look at, and that is the pediatrics for skid. Um, and I'll do that probably in another video uh, to get a better idea of exactly the details of the pediatric side of this. So thank you for for listening and um, thank you for uh, paying it paying attention to these video series. This probably is gonna be a four part series, I apologize. That last part, I think I'm gonna open it up to the audience to ask questions. And I'll try to answer your questions as best as I can on that fourth part. Um, and if there's something I don't know, I'll, I'll follow up and, and do a video to uh, answer your question. It's complicated. Uh, there's a lot of interaction. It's hard to keep everything in your memory bank to be able to explain this. But there is this interplay between the immune system being down, um, uh, the activity is being brought down, and uh, the ability to uh, fight these infections and these opportunistic infections are starting to take hold, especially in the pediatric group. So that's my thesis on this. Um, let me, let me, uh, there was, uh, I'm sorry, hold on, hold on. There was one other thing that I wanted to say. I wanted to say that to 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 uh, to explain. Okay, there was a piece of this that that a little I wanted to kind of go into a little bit more detail, and I I apologize for not doing it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up right now. Okay. Um, all right, so let's walk through, remember what I was saying that you have lymph coming into the, the lymph node, all right, and you, you have these, you have antigens that are coming from either bacteria or viruses or whatever, right, and it's coming into the a afferent vessel into the into the the lymph node okay and you you have these antigen presenting cells right that are through the dendrites that are presenting these these antigens all right and they will present to the t cell which i i showed you in these diagrams in the powerpoint now they can be activated, right? But there's also another another interplay that that can that can happen, which is important to to go over here. Uh, B cells can activate be activated um, through the afferent lymph, right? We just focused on the T cell side of this. All right, so so a B cell can acquire an antigen. All right, and you got to remember these B cells are in that germinal um, center in the cortex, right? So when these B cells bind um, to this antigen and they get activated, they can immediately create uh, IgMs, okay? So this is where the IgM part of this starts to take hold, all right? Now with... with um, With the B cell bring, internalizing the antigen, the follicular helper cells near this T zone, B zone that I was talking about, because remember in the pair in the paracortex, in the in the in the cortex, there is this there is this zone right next to each other where there's this communication that's going on between the B cell and the T cell, 
This is the B and T cell zone inter interface, right? Well, you can have a B cell that is internalized an antigen, right? Now, it can two things can happen. That B cell will immediately start to secrete se secrete um, antibodies, right? Uh, so the B cell will immediately, um, you know, turn into a plasma cell and secrete the 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 IgMs, or this internalized antigen within the B cell can can present. It'll act as like an antigen presenting cell, and it will it will communicate with a, a follicular helper T cell near this BT zone. Now, when this follicular helper T cell is is activated, all right this will start to upregulate a receptor uh, um, or not a receptor, a, a, a ligand, um, CD, it's called a CD40L. And that will help to produce class switching. So there's this, iso, this isotype class switching for a B cell. When that happens, then you can switch to IgMs and and uh, you know and other types, so I didn't really go into detail about class switching, but some of this class switching is this class switching is starting to take place in the lymph node, which is something I didn't bring up. So in AIDS-like syndrome, if you can inhibit the CD40L or the CD40 receptor, so the ligand or the receptor then you're preventing the class switching from taking place and you have a, a depleted um, 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 class switch antibody population, right? So, you know, this is another manifestation of the AIDS-like syndrome. If you can inhibit the class switching, you're not going to get the Ig. And or the IgGs and the the you know the other antibodies that that need to be produced. Now this is part of skid, right? And when I do skid, maybe this whole class fish switching thing will make sense to you. But the point here is is that not only do you have an antigen presenting cell activating a T cell and doing all these T helper cell activations that we went over in the PowerPoint, but you also have a T cell that can acquire a, an antigen in the lymph that's coming into the lymph node. And some of these B cells will activate and turn into plasma cells and create the IgMs. Now there are gonna be other B cells that are actually kind of present by this border between the paracortex and the cortex where it will start to interface with follicular T cells and those follicular T cells will help with class switching for the B cells and create other types of antibodies other than just IgMs. So this is where the IgGs come from, all right? And it's important that if any of these processes that are inhibited, then you will start to see a, a depletion of effective B cell or T cells and uh, effective antibodies about antibody count, uh, which is all under the umbrella of AIDS like syndrome. So hopefully that kind of helps with, with uh, understanding a little bit more of what's going on. Um, I know it's a little complicated. I apologize for the, the complexity of this, but um, it is uh to, to really get your head around the AIDS-like syndrome, uh, you need to understand this part of it really, really well. Um, and, and uh, you know, you, you can, you'll, you'll get a better, a better feel for what I'm saying. Now, let me share you my screen here.
please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. I have a lot of great products to offer. I have nano silvers, liquids and gels, soaps and lozenges, multi multivitamins, uh, probiotics, applicators for spraying nozzle, uh, na nasal, uh, or just a spritz bottle or, you know, a, a, a fluid dropper. I have C60, two ounce, four ounce, eight ounce in avocado and coconut oil. I have a ton of, of different supplements that you should be, you know, getting, you know, such as turmeric and the D3s and the omega-3s, the ashwagandhas, the resveratrols, the, the collagen, you know, and that's just a subset of the stuff that I have. And the all natural deodorants, um, the citrus and the peppermint lavender, these will help to detoxify your body. These have been made by Rainbow Herbals by Gail, and uh, they're made from essential oils from the Himalayas, extremely uh, uh, high quality, it'll help to detoxify your body. And, um, uh, you know, and obviously you can use them as a deodorant, you use it every day. So it's, it's a, it's a multifunctional product, but, uh, please go to my store and, and get the products that I offer to help support my work and to help support your health. I've been saying on many of my videos, you know, the benefits of these. So I'm not going to do that in this video, but uh, please go to the store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the products that will help with your health, especially the toothpaste and the Max 35s and, and the C60s, the ashwagandha, the turmerics, and the lozenges were in the cold season. And then, uh, you know, I have a lot of these different uh, structural nano silver soaps that are very, very high quality. So please go to the store, thud-studio-reykjavik.com. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to all my channels. I have three channels on YouTube. I have Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. Please subscribe. The links are in the description of this video and in all my videos. And thank you for your support and have a nice day.